good day, ladies and gentlemen. This is a first here on the podcast. I get to interview a nun. I'm very excited about this. Um, don't get to see nuns very often. Uh, where I go to Mass, we have traditional priests, but it's not often we have nuns, so I'm very excited about this. I'm here today with Sister Josepha of the Eucharist. Sister Mary Josepha grew up in a Catholic homeschooling family that fostered her interest in religious life from an early age. Her father, being a Marine, her family moved frequently. By the time Sister Mary Josepha was 12, she had lived in nine different homes. She attended Thomas Aquinas College in California, where the liberal arts program culminating in the study of sacred theology, led her to pursue two more years of studies at the International Theological Institute in Gaming, Austria. In 2010, after she finished her studies at the Institute, she entered the Benedictines of Mary, Queen of Apostles. When she entered the Benedictines of Mary, uh, when she entered, the Benedictines of Mary were still in a temporary residence in Kansas City, but they finished building their permanent monastery in Gower, Missouri, and moved there while Sister Mary Josepha was still a postulant. She received a religious name in honor of St. Joseph in 2019. She was sent as one of the founding members of the community's first daughter house, the Monastery of St. Joseph, in the Ozark Mountains near Ava, Missouri. Having moved three times as a nun, she is looking forward to a fourth and perhaps final move when the permanent monastery is finished, hopefully next year. And Sister is joining me today to talk about this book just released by Tan, uh, the Life of Sister Mary Wilhelmina of the Bene- by the Benedictines of Mary, Queen of Apostles. For the viewers, if they're unaware, Sister Wilhelmina was uh, unearthed and there was a, they had to move her body for ren- renovations and things like this, and she was found to be incorrupt. And so this is causing quite a stir, um, and it's a pretty cool and special thing going on in the church right now. So, Sister, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Kennedy. It's a privilege. I'm, uh, yes, as I said, I'm very honored. And ladies and gentlemen, we, um, traditional nuns don't spend a lot of time on the internet. So um, the internet isn't the fastest. So we're going to, if there's a little bit of a lag, that's why. Um, okay. So um, I would like to ask you a couple questions. Um, or get, maybe just get your kind of commentary on a couple things in the book that really stood out to me as I was reading this. And um, the first thing uh, I thought was really funny was part of the backstory of Sister Wilhelmina's parents. And basically, they went to high school to, with each other, but it turned out that her mother said, that her father was definitely not his, her high school sweetheart because he was sort of a firebrand Baptist. Could you tell us a little bit about that relationship? <laughs> sure. So Sister Wilmina's mother uh, was a very extraordinary woman for her time and background, I think, born in um, to a family that was descended from slaves. Um, her grandmother was a convert to Catholicism, but her, her granddaughter, Sister Wilmina's mother, inherited a very strong love for the faith, and also a very high esteem for education. And so growing up in segregated, very poor St. Louis at that time, she had great aspirations to become a teacher and maybe even a writer, um, and especially for the sake of the church. Um, so she she had very high ideals. And then uh, Sister Wilhelmina's father came from also a very poor background, um, but he also had uh, not the Catholic faith that Sister Wilhelmina's mother had. So he had um, the Baptist background and he was almost elected the minister of their Baptist church. But he, in, before he was elected, Sister Wilhelmina's mother had talked to him about the Catholic faith and he decided to convert. So it was Sister Wilhelmina's mother's very first convert, the man that she would eventually marry. And um, I, th- I remember reading in the book as well, um, so she she went to present um, Sister Wilhelmina's father to the priest, saying, "You know, I'd like to be his godmother coming into the church." And he had a hunch they might get married, so he said, "No, you can't." Right. Yeah. And the, in that current code of canon law, it wasn't allowed for the godmother of a convert to actually marry him. They created a spiritual bond that would interfere with the natural bond of marriage. And so nowadays it's, it's all right for the spouse to be a godparent uh, with the current code that we have now, but not back then. And so the priest saw where this relationship might be headed and he said, I don't think you want to be his godmother. 
it's uh, it's just great intuition on behalf of the priest. Um, yes. <laughs> and this part, I actually kind of welled up a little bit. I'm a, you know I'm a father of five children, my uh, soon to be six children, and and I was reading this piece about living through them living through the depression. And I'm just going to read a little passage here um, to set this, this the, set the stage for it. And um, so this is after, for a little context, Sister Wilhelmina's father had lost his job in 1930 um, because of, you know, economic problems. And uh, in the book it says, his world seemed to have come to an end. The insurance company for which he worked had folded. Ella was cooking in the kitchen, and from lines anchored to posts of the back porch, there were clothes flapping in the summer breeze. Oscar was sitting in a chair at the kitchen table. He saw his shirt on the line. I guess that's my last shirt, he said aloud. Ella laughed. She was nearly jovial. Nonsense, she cried. You're not that kind of man. Indeed he wasn't. He went out, got another job with another insurance company, Atlanta Life, the very next day. He went out with the backing of a woman who believed in him, a woman who had laughed aloud at his fears and who had gone on with home duty as usual. And it goes on to say um, that... She actually wouldn't even go and take government assistance um, and something else, like whatever it was, government assistance and something else. But she wouldn't go do this um, because she didn't want her husband to feel like he wasn't a good provider. Um, anyway, I just thought that was absolutely beautiful. And I think mm-hmm. that speaks to the strength of her mother and her father. Yes, I think it's very beautiful. I, her mother recognized that the greatest cross a man can have is not to be able to provide for his family. And even though not taking the welfare or the assistance of the government could offer, put her into a very high period of stress, you know, trying to provide for so many little children with very few resources. Uh, she, she didn't want to uh, jeopardize her husband's confidence in himself or his role as the father and provider of the family. Yeah, it's... Um... I've, we've never gone through a Great Depression or anything like that, but just being a father and mm-hmm. and thinking about what that would be like, how difficult that would be. It's um, yeah, what a special woman. I mean, it's no wonder that they raise such a special daughter when you see things like that with just the virtue that they have. Yes, um, indeed. There is another part here, and this is from the chapter called "My Heart Is Set," and this speaks about um, Sister Wilhelmina's devotion to the Holy Rosary. And um, it says, Sister Wilhelmina's most beloved way of honoring the Blessed Mother was the recitation of the Most Holy Rosary. Even as a seven-year-old child, Mary asked her siblings and playmates to pray the rosary with her. When they refused, she tearfully had recourse to her mother, who replied that she should pray it herself, which she did. This was the occasion of her second encounter with the Blessed Mother, who appeared to her and thanked her. Okay. Could you tell us then, of course, the importance of the rosary in the life of Sister Wilhelmina and, of course, in in her congregation, which you're a part of, but also apparently the Blessed Mother appeared to Sister Wilhelmina? That that seems like a pretty interesting story. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, indeed. So the the two stories that we were passed, we were given of Sister Wilhelmina's um, visions of Our Lady are not things that Sister readily shared. And we heard about them from her family. So they're very private um, and not something that Sister Wilmina would have noised about. Um, but it's, it's significant that she had such a tender and personal love for Our Lady. Um, and the way she expressed it was through the rosary, Our Lady's favorite devotion really to be honored with. So when I was a young sister and assigned to help Sister Wilmina throughout the day, I was always touched by the way she would look for things in groups of five and find different ways to meditate upon the five mysteries of the rosary. And if you ever asked her, what do you want to do, Sister Wilmina? Do you want to go for a walk? Do you want to pray the rosary? Do you want to read a book? She'd always say, pray the rosary. (laughs) And the best thing was if you took her down to the rosary garden uh, and she would look at the statue of Our Lady. Wow. So what what is your daily life like in... in, uh this order of nuns then? What sort of uh, rule and spirituality do you follow? We follow the Benedictine rule from the early 500s. And Sister Wilhelmina, even though she was formed in um, 
the Oblate Sisters of Providence, they also had a Benedictine background. So that was a sort of continuity between the two congregations um, in which she served. But we follow the Benedictine rule in its original monastic character. So we do not have an apostolate of teaching the way Sister Wilhelmina did in her early life. We uh, keep a life of simple work and prayer. The divine office, the recitation of the Psalms and choir forms the backbone of, of our day. It culminates, of course, in Holy Mass. Um, but we, we intersperse the divine office with little periods of work uh, that we, we try to conduct as much as possible in silence so that we can continue meditation and contemplation in our hearts while we work. There's only one hour really that we speak throughout the day. That's the hour of recreation. So the sisters will get together and have a, a lively conversation. Uh, sometimes we'll be working while we talk or we'll take a walk. Uh, but the most important thing about recreation is the talking. <laughs> Um, that must be and then I, we have um sorry continue yeah. i apologize no go ahead oh no um we also have times for private prayer of uh, spiritual reading um and even our t our meals are taken in silence with reading from one sister and so then we remember even while we're nourishing our bodies we have to nourish our souls at the same time and we conclude the day with one last hour of the divine office and then we go into what is called grand silence. We don't speak at all. Um, and that's again, to foster the intimacy with our Lord in the silence of our hearts. Wow, that is completely different than the average person in our day. And it sounds, I think I would pay somebody to let me do that for a month and get away from all the, uh, <laughs> all the, you know, the notifications and oh my goodness, I can't imagine the peace of soul. That must be amazing. Can you tell us like, so you grew up obviously in a, in a Catholic family, but what called you mm -hmm. to make such a radical decision to not only live as a nun, but in this type of monastery, this type of monastic life? Mm -hmm. Well, I heard the call fairly early. Um, my parents were very good about providing us with good books to read about the saints. And I noticed how many of them were nuns. And I thought, well, maybe God would want me to be that, but... I don't know how you do it or where you do it. Uh, I didn't see any sisters at all. The first religious sister I saw, I was probably 12, um, but she wore the modified habit. Um, she worked in a school and I didn't feel that that was what our Lord wanted from me. I was looking for something more like what I read about when I was little. Um, so I was very blessed to be introduced to these sisters by a priest friend of mine. And I, I remember when I first visited, I thought this is everything that I had in my heart from when I was little. And what especially captivated me was the, um, the recitation of the office. Um, we follow the order of psalmody that St. Benedict himself describes in his holy rule. And we use the ancient Gregorian chant. Um, so it's a very beautiful, um, solemn way to perpetuate the divine office throughout the day. And I thought if, if I become a nun, this is the way I want to pray. This will be what nourishes my interior life. That's, um... You know, I just I just finished reading John Senior's book, The Restoration of Christian Culture, where he basically mm -hmm. makes the case um, where, you know, the Benedictine rule is Europe, and you know, the Europe it is Christendom, um, obviously modified mm -hmm. for the different realms of life. You have obviously the the more cloistered types of monastic life, like yourself. And then obviously there's sort of concentric circles that come out of that of the varying degrees until you get to the laity, which they all have their purpose. Um, but part of that rule of life, spending X amount of time in contemplation and prayer and silence, no matter who you are, that's something that is necessary in order to keep peace of soul. Do you, um, does your monastery, does your convent do any things like retreats or things like that for, for lay women who are looking to get away? Yes, but also for um, for men also, and especially for priests. Our charism is to pray and sacrifice for priests. Our full title is Benedictines of Mary, Queen of Apostles. Mm -hmm. So we look to Our Lady in that last period of her life after Our Lord's Ascension, but before her own assumption, when she lived in Ephesus in modern-day Turkey, and she prayed and sacrificed for the early church, but especially for the apostles, the first priests. And they would come and visit her at Ephesus. So of course, St. John lived with her, um, but you might remember one of the epistles, St. Paul says, I will tarry at Ephesus this winter. 
So you can imagine that he was going there to see Our Lady to find that place of spiritual refreshment in the midst of his busy apostolate. And so it's very important for us as Benedictines of Mary, Queen of Apostles, to provide a retreat place for priests. And we've been blessed to welcome many over the years. Even at our foundation, we have very small temporary quarters. We still have a separate cabin that we can reserve for priests to come on retreat. Oh, that's wonderful. I have a funny story about an interaction I had with some traditional sisters. I was um, I was traveling to Quebec, so I'm in Canada, and I, I was traveling to Quebec uh, to do some filming with Father Sherry, who is the superior of the Society of St. Pius X here. And the sisters are on, ha they have this old, beautiful school chapel thing from the glory days of Quebec Catholicism. And I was arriving about four in the morning, I was driving overnight, and he gave me the directions, but to get into this place, it's this old labyrinthine convent where you take one wrong turn and you're like in a different wing of the place and it was pitch black. So I thought I went to the right area for the bedrooms and it turned out I was I was just outside the woman's side and I went into, there was no one there, but I went in and I slept there for like three hours until 7 a.m. mass. And I got up in the morning, I, fought, mm -hmm. I saw Father and he said, Kennedy, you weren't on the right side of the of the convent. Or, or, and I... <laughs> And the, the, the sisters looked at me like, tisk tisk young man. And I said, I'm sorry, I had no idea. So I was on the right side the next day. But um, that's that was my last time I stayed with someone. <laughs> <laughs> yes, most convents have doors plastered with cloister, private, do not enter. It's yeah. very confusing, I know, for laity when they visit. Yeah. Anyway, so that, but that, yeah, but they're not, they're not cloistered. Obviously, these are sort of... Uh, you know they're they're separate with their living quarters, but they're out there serving the priests in the more in the secular sphere. But um, but okay, so Sister Wilhelmina started off, and then uh, she started off before the council, and then kind of after the council, the time of that sort of civil rights era where you know the spirit of the '60s, man, that got everybody. It got the church, it got the society, everything was the spirit of the '60s was everywhere, and she saw all this change, and she was very conflicted about it. And she sort of adopted some, didn't adopt others. And then she kind of had this moment of major interior conversion when she went and saw her mother after her father's funeral. Could you please tell us about that? Yes. So the turmoil in the 60s and 70s affected Sisters Order very strongly. And one of the areas of experimentation was the religious habit. So after years of wearing a beautiful traditional habit, Sister Wilhelmina was forced to try different sorts of modified habits. And one which she particularly disliked was what she called the hair showing one. <laughs> so it had a modified veil that showed just a little bit of the hair in front. And so she, she had to go along with it. There wasn't a lot of options if you didn't have the modified habit. But when she went home wearing this, what she called the hair showing habit, her mother said, I, I'm so glad your father can't see you in that. And it was quite striking for Sister Wilhelmina. And cl closely after that, or yes, closely after that, the pilgrim statue of Our Lady of Fatima came to visit her convent. And she made a resolution at that moment, a promise to Our Lady that she would not abandon the traditional habit, regardless of what happened. And so she was forced for the next few years, even decades, to try to make her own habit because the sisters weren't helping her. But she persevered. Um, she ended up leaving that community when things became so difficult that she couldn't uh, aspire to reform. So she started afresh and she always made it very clear in our community, we would have the traditional habit and brought many vocations. And I'm, I'm very glad to say that sister was able even to pass away wearing her religious habit for which she sacrificed so much. Um, now, if, if I read the book right, when she remade her mm -hmm. habit, she actually had to use like a piece of plastic from a bleach <laughs> container. What what was that? Yes. <laughs> oh, it was just the forehead piece is usually a starched, stiff piece. At least it was with a very traditional, the older style. Um, and so she wasn't receiving any help from her fellow sisters to try to make the traditional headgear. And so she said, well, I'll just cut one out of plastic. That way I won't have to starch it. <laughs> and so that was her, what she called her forehead piece um, for, for many years. Wow. So she did. Now, was it a piece of plastic or was it a piece of plastic covered in fabric and it helped to keep its shape? 
I think it was just the fa- the plastic. I think she just cut it out uh, because it was white, you know, and curved. And she just put it in under the, the wimple to make the forehead piece. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. That's just, mm-hmm. that would not be comfortable. That is like a hair shirt on your forehead. No. Indeed. Yeah. Goodness gracious. No, wow. Um, yeah. So then she eventually changes. She leaves this 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 order she's in. And then was it the mid-90s mm-hmm. when she started the current order? Yes. So she professed vows in her original family, religious family, in 1944. And so for over 50 years, she was a very faithful member of the community. It was only in the 90s that she realized I can't, that she couldn't, um, she couldn't see any hope for reform within her own community. And so she left um, with much heartache because it was her religious family. And she started our community in 1995 with just two companions. And she served as the superior for the first year um, and to really set the tone for much of what would follow. At that point, she was well over 70. So she resigned the superiorship to a younger sister but she remained a, a source of inspiration to the sisters who entered. And what was her purpose uh, and found, her overall goal in founding this particular order? Yes, she wanted to preserve the traditional religious observances that safeguard uh, religious life. So she wanted a community that would have the traditional liturgy that would still Uh, preserve the times of silence in the cloister uh, that would have a necessary separation from the world uh, and the religious habit. All of these things safeguard the identity of the religious life. So it's in her community, she realized they were becoming so associated with uh, worldly pursuits that um, they were starting to lose their identity as brides of Christ. They were more like social workers or uh, just lay women living in community. And she realized that Um, The traditional prayer of the church, silence, separation from the world, all these things protected the religious sister's identity as a bride of Christ. And this was so foundational to her own vocation. Um, She wanted to preserve that for other vocations to come. And I think our Lord showed that he, he approved that by sending so many young women to join her. You know, after starting with just two companions in 1995, now they're now they're over 60 Benedictines of Mary between our two houses. Wow, that's incredible. It's, it is true, though. The traditional mm-hmm. orders of sisters are booming. You know, I was in um, Maryland. Uh, shout out to my friends, the Smiths down there. And we were near the um, Carmelites who are in Fairfield. And um, mm-hmm. we went there for Mass one morning. And just, it's you know, they just, they can't... You know, they, 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 it's a good problem to have. They have to keep kind of expanding. They have to build a bigger chapel and these kinds of things because they can't keep up with demand. And it's wonderful. Um, you know, all these traditional yeah. traditional sisters over in Italy, um, they're, you know, getting vocations from all over the world. And um, it's just people are hungering for everything that the traditional religious life has to offer. And um, maybe you could speak to the importance of the professed religious in the church. It's something we've lost so much since the Second Vatican Council, but really like the, the way I've understood it is the traditional sisters and brothers are like the engine of the culture and they and their prayers mm-hmm. are like keeping it alive. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Um, I like to think of the mystical body of Christ in terms of the human body. And so of course there need to be hands and feet and eyes and ears um, to do the external activities but there needs to be a heart to pump the blood to all the members. There needs to be lungs to bring the air in, to vivify the whole body. And I see the contemplative orders as fulfilling that obligation within the, the mystical body. They don't, they don't do an exterior function that can be seen, um, but they, they perform uh, an interior function. What they are is um, more important than what they do for the mystical body, if that makes sense. Uh, another way I think it can be understood as is as um, the contemplative nun is like the uh, stay-at-home mother 
within the church. And again, the, the stay-at-home mother doesn't do something that society can quantify or uh, she, doesn't, she doesn't have a job that people can appreciate. She performs a very hidden function, um, but her presence in the home is so vital for the children. It was, I think Winston Churchill who said, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. And so more than what she does, what she is for that child or for the whole family, um, it, it preserves that, that foundational building block for society, the, the family. And so if that's true for the natural society, how much for the supernatural society, it needs these people who are, are dedicated just to be in the presence of God, um, to bring the petitions of the world to him, um, but also to bring the adoration um, and to to show by their very lives that he is first and he correspondingly can give more graces to society through uh, souls that are consecrated to him and praying for the rest of the world. To, well, to quote another Englishman, G.K. Chesterton, um, he talked about, um, <laughs> you know, there was this rage for women's suffrage back in the, the tens and twenties. And he said, they're not realizing that they, they make or break the political sphere with how they raise the children in the nursery, the power that a mother has over yeah. over the civilization, and that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, it's it, we need to pray more. Everyone watching this, you need to pray that there are more and more vocations. And if you have little children, uh, you need to promote these things. You know, if there's a Carmelite or 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 the Benedictine sisters or something within driving distance. Um, you know, when you bring your little daughters, especially to see these things and to see these nuns, uh, it's just, it's almost, it's kind of like when they, you know, my, my daughter likes to wear like princess outfits and, you know, the damsel in distress and her brothers are the knights and you don't do the whole little thing. Right. And, um, and it's like, you can tell her heart is kind of fluttering when she plays these games. It's kind of almost like a romance, but then something similar happens to little girls when they see sisters wearing the religious habit, because it's almost... Um, I think they implicitly know that there's another type of marriage, if that makes sense. There's another type of, there's another type of, um, I guess, romance with God or something. I don't know the right word I'm trying to use here. I'm trying to be poetic, but there's something yeah. that speaks to them. Yeah, and, and marriage yeah. is the right word. <laughs> yeah, marriage is indeed the right word because St. Paul says that the um, the marriage between man and woman is a sign, a great sign of the union between Christ and His Church. But that union is a is affected in a very personal way between the consecrated soul and God. And so in a way, human marriage is a sign of the reality that the consecrated nun has, uh, that brideship with Christ. And how did Sister Wilhelmina cultivate this brideship um, in the sisters? Yes. Well, it's her brideship began very early when she received her first Holy Communion. She heard our Lord say to her in her heart, do you want to be mine? Will you be mine? And she said, of course, Lord, but she didn't know what that meant yet. It was only when she grew up that she realized this spousal union with, with Christ would be affected through religious life. Um, but she wanted us, to, uh, her sisters, to preserve that identity. Um, so she saw herself very much as a daughter of our Blessed Mother. She saw herself very much as a bride of our Lord. And it wasn't about the, the work that we did, but the, the person that we were, uh, that, or the person that we are, that is so, um, so important in our own vocation and so important in our, our role in the mystical body. That's beautiful. So she passed away in 2017, correct? A 2019. 2019. We had just left on foundation. So just a few weeks after we left, we got the call from Mother Abbas, come back home, Sister Wilmina's passing. Okay. And was her, I mean, her death, was it a very beautiful affair? I know death is, is a difficult thing, but it seems like she must have had a very holy it death. Was, it was indeed. It was a great grace for herself, but also for all of us, because as I said, we had just left to start the daughter house. But Mother Abbas said, no, come home. You need to be here when sister passes. And so we all came back. And there were, at that time, I think 48 or so of us, maybe a few more. Um, but we took turns keeping vigil around her bedside. We would gather frequently to pray the rosary and to sing her favorite 
her final words were not spoken but sung. It was while we were trying, while we were singing the Salve Regina around her bed. Um, no, the Hail Holy Queen. It was the Hail Holy Queen. She started mouthing the words, and then she actually sang the word Maria, and that was her last word, sung with the rest of us. Wow. Um, she she couldn't open her eyes at that point. She kept them closed, but you could tell by her facial expressions um, that she was very aware of what was going on around her. So we spent a couple of days like this, just alternating who would be with her in her room. But the very day that she passed, um, which was the vigil of the Ascension, we all gathered. So every single sister was there clustered around her bed. Um, we prayed the rosary, we sang her favorite hymns again, and then we had a time of recreation where we shared messages that people had sent in from all across the country, assuring us of their prayers, of their love for Sister Wilhelmina. Um, and after we finished that time of recreation, which was lighthearted, we laughed, um, we shared stories. Uh, the last thing we did was pray Compline all together. And as you probably know, at the end of Benedictine Compline, the superior takes holy water and sprinkles it on the heads of each of the sisters. And so she sprinkled Sister Wilhelmina first, and then each of us. But she noticed Sister Wilhelmina's face change when she received the holy water. And it was as the sprinkling of holy water finished that Sister actually breathed forth very peacefully, very silently. So it was, it was a very... Um, it was a very momentous moment for us, the first of our sisters to pass, but um, what a beautiful thing that we were all there to see it and that it, it was in such a liturgical context. And it was particularly poignant because Sister Wilhelmina's favorite Benedictine saint, Saint Bede, also passed away after Compline on the Vigil of the Ascension. So she kind of was following in the footsteps of her favorite Benedictine saint. Um, and then the following day was her baptismal anniversary. So there were many uh, significant aspects to the day, the hour, the manner of her passing. Wow. That's the way to go. <laughs> if you're going to go, that's, that's a beautiful... Indeed. <laughs> wow. What an amazing story. That's, that's giving me goosebumps. Um, so, and then four years later, though, there comes a moment when her body's exhumed Perhaps you could tell us why that even happened and then what you discovered. Yes. So four years later, um, we were putting the finishing touches on the Abbey Church, which included a side altar to St. Joseph. And it is a Benedictine custom to have the relics of the founder or foundress in the Abbey Church. So we thought this St. Joseph's altar would be the appropriate place to put Sister Wilhelmina's relics. So the sisters dug up her grave and brought up the coffin. And we were expecting just to find bones at that point because it was four years later and in a very humid climate of simple wooden coffin. Um, but we were quite surprised when the lid of the coffin was removed to see Sister Wilmia's body still remarkably intact and her entire habit perfectly preserved. And for sisters who sew, as we do, we know how um, the natural fibers, the wool or the cotton of the habit would have disintegrated over such time. Uh, we had lined her coffin with a satin material. That was completely gone. You couldn't even tell that there had been any cloth lining the coffin itself. But her her habit, her wimple, her veil, all was perfectly preserved. And we took that as a little sign from our Lord that he valued what she had suffered for that habit. And in, even in death, he wasn't going to let it decompose. <laughs> Well, and that's fascinating because if it was still if it was still the plastic part of the habit, we can understand how that wouldn't decompose. <laughs> but the actual, yeah, the fibers <laughs> like that would for sure decompose. So that's uh, so. I mean, this is this is a miracle, you know. I mean, this doesn't happen every day. So um, it's been pretty. Much, it's been a whirlwind, hasn't it? People coming to visit and 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 praying at her um, at her remains and so forth. Yes. Um... We're waiting, of course, for the church's official process before we make any pronouncements about whether it's a miracle or not. But it's certainly um, not what we ha would have expected in the natural order of things. And I think that many people recognize that also. And so what was just a, a, a grace for our community, you know, seeing our foundress and her, her habit preserved for so many years, um, it's, it's overflowed for laity too around the world. and. People have come from across the country, thousands of them, just to see Sister Wilmina. And um, I think she's a sign of hope 
a sign that life doesn't end with death and that the things that we sacrifice for um, the traditions of the church, the traditional prayer, the traditional religious life, the habit, all these things are precious in God's eyes and worth the sacrifice and he will reward that in the life to come. You know what else I think is so special about this affair is uh, in, in this sort of modern era that we're in, the way canonizations have been taking place and the causes, for some people it seems kind of artificial. You know, a lot of the time it's it's not really the way that it was where it was organic with occultists and, a, you know, a very clear story and a very natural organic growth of piety or, or devotion to this. But this this instance right here, this is like old school, old school Catholicism. You know, it's uh, for one, obviously, the, the habit and the traditional order and things like that. But really, I mean, this is like those this is like the stories you read about as a child about about these Catholics from back in the day, you know, it's, you opened up so-and-so's grave and uncorrupt, and then there's a miracle here and people visit, and it just sounds like, you know, it's like something with St. With, uh, Thomas Beckett or something like that. It does. Um, yeah. And I, it's perhaps our Lord just wanting to call forth a response of that old-fashioned faith. Sister Wilmina always took God at his word, and so I'm not surprised that he's rewarding her in a very um, traditional way, so to speak. Yeah, that's amazing. That's absolutely wonderful. So what um, what is her spiritual legacy for the community, in your opinion? I think the um, the thing that she wished us to, to take away from her was that devotion to Our Lady, filial, tender, personal devotion to Our Blessed Mother. Because if we go to Our Lady, then we find our Lord in the safest, most secure way imaginable. And if we go to her as little children, we'll find everything she'll provide for us as a mother will. And the best thing that she'll give us will be her son. So as Benedictines of Mary, Queen of Apostles, we, we gather around Our Lady and if we look to her for our exam, the grace that we need at every moment, especially at the moment of our death, and I think this this devotion to Our Lady is something that Sister Wilhelmina would want everyone to have. Uh, so all the people visiting, um, all the people reading about her or listening to this, I think she would want them to um, reevaluate their relationship with the Blessed Mother, to really um, be faithful about that daily rosary and to go to Our Lady with the childlike confidence that she will provide everything that we need at the grace of the present moment, all the way up until the moment of our death. That's beautiful. That's uh, especially, especially in these uncertain times for Catholics and just uh, the situation in the church and in the world, there can be a lot of anxiety. Um, but I'm reminded of what our Lord says in the gospel, you know, the, the birds neither sow nor reap, but their heavenly father provides. And we know that if we bring our petitions to Mary, that she always brings them faithfully to her son. And uh, I think the life of Sister Wilhelmina is, a, is a, well, living in, a, a, living an everlasting life example, not just a living example, but a, an eternally living example of, of this type of faithfulness. Sister, is, how can we, um, is there any way that the viewers can support, you know, or, or perhaps you guys do take prayer requests and things like that? Where can they contact or find uh, how mm-hmm. to support your ministry that you guys have? Yes, our our website, benedictinesofmary.org, has a lot of information about our charism. It has a page just for about Sister Wilhelmina. Um, there's a, a prayer request site where you can send your requests for the sisters to remember in their prayers. And there's also various ways that you can help our community. As we were talking about earlier, our vocations are um, on the boom <laughs> in these traditional orders. So our community outgrew the mother house twice at this point. And if they're trying to make um, cardboard box cells in the basement at the Abbey right now, just to accommodate all the young women who want to enter. And our temporary house in Ava is overflowing. So at this point, we're trying very hard to finish the permanent monastery in Ava, which is quite a challenge, the building market being what it is. So we appreciate any gift, large or small. And all of our benefactors, they're entitled to a share in our, in our life. You know, they will benefit from our prayers, our sacrifices in perpetuity. So if they wish to make even the smallest donation, we will are very grateful for it and God will reward them for it. It sounds like a pretty good deal, guys. If you're watching this, 
help the sisters out <laughs> and they'll give you something better than, you know, that better than money. That's wonderful. Um, okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is the book right here. You can find this in the link. Uh, you find the link for this in the description of this video, The Life of Sister Mary Wilhelmina by the Benedictines of Mary, Queen of Apostles. Um, thank you to Tan Books for sending me that. And um, thank you to the sisters for writing this book. It's very well written, very easy to read. It's very nice. Um, sister, it's been an absolute pleasure. I don't want to keep you too long from your life. That is much better than staring at screens You have in this be beautiful existence you guys have. So I think we'll stop the, the show here. Um and um, please pray for me, if you would. Um, I know that my I know that we could use them, so it's it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much, Kendi. And please be assured of our prayers. The work you do is very important for the church right now. Well, thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as always, let me know what you think in the comments, um, and visit the sisters' website and and help them out. And we all need some more. We need some more nuns. And and if you have daughters and and sons as well, but if you have daughters, find a traditional convent traditional monastic life and take your daughters to see it so we can so we can flood the church with vocations this has been the kennedy report ladies and gentlemen until next time god bless <laughs>